Okay, quick first question in the round. Who would say he's a designer, a web designer? Okay, some of you would be saying he's a developer? Almost the same people, okay. <laughs> Good. Okay, this uh, presentation will mostly be for designers, I would guess, because developers usually know about variables and things like that. But even those who know a little bit about this, I hope also you will get something out of my presentation. Okay, just start a, a little bit on an introduction. Who am I? My name is Werner Kau. I'm living in Berlin, Germany. I'm a PHP developer. I also develop uh, WordPress plugins as a hobby right now. Some plugins I develop for the company I work in. Um, what makes me a uh, specific and expert for this topic? I really like to figure out how to do things with CSS. So I'm not a front-end developer. I would say I'm a PHP back-end developer. But every time there are some tricky parts in CSS and the designer designs something and he wants to turn it into HTML and CSS, that's where I try to figure out how to work it, uh, make it work. I'm also um, the organizer of the uh, WordPress meetup group in Berlin, and we also organize some WordCamps in Berlin, and might have one this year. Um, I also blog uh, about development and WordPress and things like that. Yeah. It's my Twitter handle. So, what is SAS? That's probably what most of you are <laughs> want to know. So SAS, it's an acronym for Synthetically Awesome Style Sheets. <laughs> so what is it then? Uh, SAS is a CSS preprocessor. Now you know. No? <laughs> okay. Put it simple, it's something like coding in CSS. And that's how it can look like. Uh, the important thing is that has two different syntaxes. There's the indented style uh, syntax, which is um, has a file ending thus, and there's the more CSS looking syntax on the right, and the file ending is SCSS. Usually when people talk about thus, they mean the right hand side, because the indented <coughs> syntax is nothing uh, designer is used to, is used to semicolons and brackets and things like that. So usually they use the right uh, syntax, but they talk about thus. Just uh, let you know. So okay, what are the features of thus? What can you do with thus? There are some very basic uh, concepts. The first and probably the most important thing when you start with thus is variables. Then you have nesting, partials, and imports. You have mix in, that's some kind of functions. And you have some kind of inheritance and some operators. And I will give you a, some examples for all of them. So, variables. Everybody using some kind of programming language like, like PHP or JavaScript, you know what, what the variables you have a variable name and you have a value for it and then you can use this variable in your code. So you don't have to repeat like the primary color over and over again, you just have one variable and when you want to change the color you just change the one variable and it's changed in your whole code. So what would that look like in ordinary CSS? It would look something like this. So thus is uh, taken and the variables are replaced by the values they have and you get this CSS. Uh, this CSS. Then the next thing is nesting. So you have something like this. That doesn't look any more like ordinary CSS. Like you have some brackets and inside the brackets you have some other selectors. And in CSS it will look like this. So you don't have to write such selectors with nav ul and nav le and things like that. You can just use nesting and it's a lot easier to read and yeah, 
you are a lot quicker in organizing your code. Then there's partials. Uh, partials, uh, that's actually when you, when you create a ZAS file, um, then usually it creates a CSS file with the same code. But when you prefix it with an underscore, this file is not like translated into a CSS code by its own. It's just to be imported in other, in other files. And that is where the next topic comes, it's imports. So you can have one CSS file and import other files. And when you take something like uh, a child theme for 2015, then you can say, okay, I'm, I'm importing the standard <coughs> CSS file. That would be an ordinary import, which is not recommended anymore, but it would just do an import of a CSS file as you know it from CSS. But the other tools are importing some ZAS files, and so the the code in these files will be combined and then it will be turned into a CSS. So usually you would have something like a variables file where you define all your, all your variables and then you might have many partials. So when your project grows very large, it's a very good idea to split your CSS code into multiple files. And because um, ZAS is combining all those partials together, you can really have say hundreds of files. So let's say you have one file for the header, you have one for the footer, you have one for the main navigation, you have one for the sidebar or for a specific widget or things like that. So you can really have very organized codes even in subfolders and when you search for something you exactly know where it is. Let's take the 2015 style CSS, I don't know how, exactly how long it is, but it has a very huge comments uh, at the start saying okay we have, let's say, 20 numbers, and in number one, there's like normalize, and number two, there's like sizes and colors and things like that. And then you have thousands of lines of CSS code, and every time you search for something, you have to scroll through the, this huge file, and when you use partials, and you split your code into <laughs> different files, and you just combine them in one file, it's, it's a lot easier to handle your code. Like in my project, the main file is only using imports. There's not a single selector or a single property I said. It's only importing all the other partials. And it's quite easy. You can just like comment something out and then this code from the partial is gone. So it's even when you want to get rid of something, just comment the import out and then it's gone. So very handy. Then there's mix-ins. That's probably one of the most powerful functions in, in ZAS. But one of the functions or of, of the features most users don't use at the beginning because they have enough to do with variables and nesting. But mixins are really like functions in other programming languages. So let's say you have something like a border radius for some element. All of you might know those vendor prefixes you have to use. I hope not so long, but like WebKit border radius and what's border radius and things like that. And you always have to write all of them. And when you have a mix in like this, you just pass the border radius, the value, and then it will create all the CSS. So it, in the end, it will look like this. So instead of using border radius, you just call the mix in, which is done by using include, and then the mix in name, and then the values. And also like, one mix in can call other mixes and so on. <clears throat> so then there's extent, or some call it inheritance. Let's say you have um, some uh, selector for a message. So you have like a div with a border, some padding, and a color. And then you might have an error message or a success message. So most probably, the CSS will be exactly the same in, and you only like change the border color or you change the background color. So usually you write the exact same CSS again and again for all the different messages or you use different classes like one class for message and then one for success and one for error and you combine them together and with the extend feature you can say okay I'm using this message selector and I'm extending it 
with some properties. And the CSS would look like this. So we have like an ordinary mes message, then you have a success message and an error message. They are all sharing the, co the same code. And then like for success and error, you have some extra code. That's how the extent is working. It's a little complicated in the beginning because you might think that like this code is imported into this uh, other selector, but it's the other way around. So you just extend the selector and only define the, the property you have extra in the, in the other selector. Then there's operators. So what you can do with us is you can do some math and you can even have different uh, types of uh, units. So let's say um, you have a container and you have like an article and a sidebar and you want to make the article, what is it here, 66%, so two thirds and the, the sidebar one third. So yeah, then you can do some, some math, you um, use the width of the, of the article you want to have, divide it by the uh, container width, and then multiply it with 100%. And then you get uh, the results in, in width in percent. So it's, it's very easy to let CSS, uh, SCSS calculate how wide should something be. You can even do things like, okay, I have a color and I want to lighten it by 25%, or I want to desaturate it by 10%, or things like that. So there's even functions to make some calculations on like hexadecimal color values and things like that. They're very handy and especially doing the math. So let's say you have a header with a fixed height and then you have like the container and like the header, uh, the container must have a padding, padding top because like the navigation is fixed. And then on one point you want to increase the, the height of the header. Then usually you, you would have to go through all your codes and recalculate all the values. But like when you used a variable in the first place for the height of the header, and then you use this variable for the padding for your container, then you can just use this and let's say uh, calculate a little bit with it. Yeah. So you don't have to calculate <coughs> values when you change like the container with this, things like that. So then that's like the standard SAS features. Like that's the basics. Then there's also extensions. So like the, the one mix in we saw with the border radius, there's an extension that has exactly this uh, mix in. And one of the yeah, most popular ones is Compass. Usually when you find any guide online for SAS, they will show you, okay, do this and this with Compass. So just to know, Compass is an extension to SAS and most designers, they use Compass. And they extend SAS with some helper functions, like the one I, I was uh, saying, like the saturation and desaturation mm -hmm. or lightening or darkening of colors, and then mix-ins like for border radius and box shadows and things like that. And it's like Compass is especially useful when you use it with CSS3 properties. So let's give an example. We had uh, the border radius already before, but there's even more like box shadow and background. And like in this case, we use a linear gradient for the background. And like border radius and box shadow are uh, yeah, pretty simple because they have better prefixes, but they look almost the same in all browsers. But like the linear gradient, they have different like uh, the attributes are in a different order, and then they have different namings for <coughs> like some as to bottom. So when you use those mix ends, you will get this CSS. So you see there's the border radius with the vendor prefixes, then there's box shadow with the vendor prefixes. They look all the same in case of the attributes. But then when you look at background, uh, you see there are some differences, like the 
linear gradient, the CSS3 generic style is to bottom, and like the WebKit linear is top. So that's one of the differences. And it's not easy to write such uh, uh, CSS codes by hand. You have to know all the differences between the different prefixes. <coughs> and then there's even things like uh, the first uh, background. That's a very handy trick. Um, um, linear gradient is, I think, only available in IE9 and newer. And IE6 is not... Uh, yeah. No, uh, IE8 cannot... Uh, oh, wait, okay, S, SVG is not even, I think, in IE8. Okay, I think that the first one is for IE9, because it's generating an SVG image with a linear gradient, and then turn it into like an inline image, and including it as a CSS. So it's converting your Define linear gradient into an SVG image and using it for IE9, which is pretty neat. So that's one of the things you probably wouldn't do when you write code for older browsers. So then there comes the big question: Which browser does support ZAS? Does anyone know? Is there any browser supporting ZAS? None of them. <laughs> There's not a single browser that can read ZAS. Well, you compile it, right? Yes. So, then how does it work? ZAS will be compiled. So, the code you've seen on the left and the code you've seen on the right, the CSS code, it's actually compiled into a CSS file. So, you write ZAS code and then you have a compiler and it's turning your ZAS code into an ordinary CSS code and this CSS file is the one you ship to your users. So there's no need for a browser to be able to read and execute uh, ZAS code. There are many different ZAS compilers out there. Like there's a, the standard ZAS and Compass, it's a, it's a Ruby gem. That's one of the uh, compilers most uh, developers use. Then there's also LibSAS, it's a library written in C and C++, it's implemented in many programming languages, there's a, like, a composer package for PHP, rendering with libsas and things like that. Then recently many developers switched to using Grunt, and there's like two different Grunt uh, compilers, there's Grunt ZAS and Grunt Contrib ZAS, so the, the one is using the libsas and the other one is uh, using the Ruby version. And there's like for Gulp and things like that. Then there's also like CodeKit for Mac and the Compass app. That's one of the apps most of the Mac users use. They use the Compass app. As far as I know, I'm not a Mac user. Um, there are also some online compilers, so you can just write your SCSS code in an <coughs> online service and then have it compiled to CSS and then you copy it over to your project. But I would uh, say you should try the ZAS or Compass for like Windows systems, maybe Compass app for Mac, if you're not so used to Ruby gems. And if you are used to Grunt, then you probably know about how to use a Grunt extension. Um, there are some differences between the LibSAS and the Ruby version. So all features are available in the Ruby uh, version, but not all of them are avail available in the LibSAS version. So make sure you you want to use the Ruby version. So it's you have all the features for the from the new SAS version. There are also some alternatives to SAS. Um, the most important one is probably less. Um, Less was um, a JavaScript library in the beginning, so the the less code was actually compiled in the browser when the user was rendering the page, which I didn't find very uh, good. So I I decided to use ZAS uh, back then. Now there's a compiler like from ZAS you can compile your less code in your development environment and then just send the CSS file. But you can still use the JavaScript uh, 
compiler. Um, then there's things like uh, Stylus and Myth, that's other preprocessors. Then there's even some other way of looking on things like that, like there's the postprocessors. We've seen the um, example with the vendor prefixes and like border radius. You have to use those mix links, like uh, adds uh, whatever the, the mix in you are using, like border radius, block shadow. So you don't write standard CSS uh, code, and the post processors they do the other way around. So they are taking the CSS file, which was compiled by Zas or less, and then they will, will add those vendor prefixes. So you don't have to use the add includes border radius mix in, you just use border radius in the CSS3 standard, and the post, uh, the, the auto prefixer will add all the vendor prefixes. So that's a, another way of taking those uh, extra steps. And that's usually used with grunt. So some, they only use sus, they don't use compass. They use only like the nesting and some mix-ins and variables, and then compile the CSS code, and then the prefixer will prefix with the vendor prefixes, and usually they have like a minifier, minifying the code and things like that. And there's also please, it's, that's another post processor, which will yeah, convert after you written your CSS code. Then there's also like CSS4. Some of the calculations we've seen before will be possible in CSS4. But, I mean, which browser does support it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the basics. That's the concepts of ZAS and the features of ZAS. And now I have some extra tips for you. And I hope that some of the developers will also get some new um, tips out of that. So one thing is comments. Usually in CSS, you only have one type of comments, which is the block comments. So slash, star, and so on. And in most programming languages, you have single length comments, like usually two slashes or a hash or something like that. And <coughs> both of them are available in ZAS, but there's one very important thing to know. A single line comment will be deleted on compilation. A block comment will not. So when you take this ZAS code, you see here's a single line comment. And here's a block comment with a variable in it. When the file is compiled into CSS, you see the single line comment is gone, but the block comment is still there, including the non-replaced variable. So let's say you comment a nesting block with some mix-ins and some variables out, they will remain in the CSS file, which is not very nice. You might use some minifier afterwards, and then they will remove the comments, but when you don't minify it afterwards, they will remain in the compiled CSS file, making them quite large and showing like the outside which variables and mixing and things <laughs> you're using, which you might not want. So then another thing is nesting. Let's take this as an example. It's an ordinary unordered list with some navigation, usually like a horizontal navigation with some floating. Um, and some, in some guides you will uh, see CSS or SCSS code like this. They take the HTML, the nesting of the HTML, and they have the same nesting in ZAS. And some of the guides online will tell you to do it this way. Um, please don't. Why? So let's let's take the bad code and see what you get in CSS. So the last line is is a quite long selector because of all those all the nesting. No web designer would write such a long selector because it's not necessary. But with the nesting, it's you're lazy and you just nest it all the way down, and then you will have something like this. And there's even another thing uh, to, to write. Let's say you take some elements out of the nesting in the HTML, or you replace it with something different. 
then you also have to replace it in the nesting, because otherwise it wouldn't work. And it's better to write it like this, so you have the main navigation, and inside the main navigation you have a list, you have a list item, and you have a link. There's no need to say the link is inside of a list item and the list item is inside of the list. That's obvious. So write it like this, with only like one uh, nesting, and then you have a CSS like this. It's still the same for the browser, but it's a lot faster to pass and it's a lot easier to read. So don't overdo nesting just because you know how to do it and you have an HTML structure and you just replicate it in the nesting thus far. So then there's the parent selector. And most of the users using SAS, they don't know about the parent selector or they don't know how to use it. So let's take this SAS file. You have a navigation link and then nested inside you have .active as a class and colon other. So you want to have the link in a different color when it's the active link and you want to have it in another color when you're hovering it. The above one is wrong and the down one is correct with the parent selector in front of the class and the colon. And why is the first wrong? Every time you use nesting, thus is adding a space in between. So the above would say, I have a navigation link and within the navigation link I have some element and this element when it's active should be in another color. But that's not what you want. You want to have the navigation link in another color when it also has the active class. And you want to have it in another color when it's hovering. Mm -hmm. So with the parent selector, you're telling us, <coughs> okay, take the whatever class something and connect it to the, to the selector, the parent selector. You can even uh, do it like... Uh, Combining some selectors, something like this would be possible. You can say I have social link, then I have social link minus Facebook and social link minus Twitter. That would compile into this, but I would not recommend to use it. For the first thing is, uh, some might not know, okay, what is this minus Facebook? So the social link might be some lines above and you don't get it right away. And on the other side, Your IDE will most probably tell you, I don't know what a minus Facebook tag is. So it's possible, but I wouldn't recommend to use it. So then there's redundant nesting. So let's say you have something like this. You have a message with a spam and a link inside. And then you might want to have a different background color when the body has a special class. So let's say you have a form and you submit the form and there an error occurred and then you add a class to the body and then all the <coughs> messages should have another border color. You should uh, you probably write it like this. So you have the same nesting again just with a, another selector in front. But you can do it like this and that's not very easy to get in the beginning. So you have message span A then you have a uh, border color, and then you have this body.error parent selector bracket. So it's, it's telling uh, thus, okay, take the nesting and the selector until this point, and then it's something before the selector. So you will get the exact same CSS out of it. And it's not only for uh, like a selector, you can even use it for media queries. So let's say you have a selector and you want to say, okay, on a specific media query, I want to do something different. Let's say I want to reduce the paddings. Then you can use a media query inside of a nesting. Then some uh, useful mix-ins I, I wrote myself while uh, using ZAS. Uh, one mix-in is, mix is for pixel <coughs> ratio. Like sometimes you want to show different images or you want to make uh, things differently when you have like a retina display. 
And here you can see the different variants of um, how to get the pixel ratio out of a browser. And even the last, uh, especially the last one, is not very easy. Here. So you have the ratio multiplied by 96, and usually you have to do all the calculation every time you use it. And this mix-in, you just give it a ratio, and it will produce all those uh, media query ratio selectors. And then the content is used, so, so you have a mix-in pixel ratio, and inside of the mix-in, you have the code you want to wrap around the media query. Mm -hmm. So a mix-in not only takes uh, a variable, but it can also have content. And then I made another one using this one. It was for like a background image, high DP. So uh, let's say you have uh, some social sharing icons as a PNG file, for example, and you want to have an SVG file for retina displays. You can use the mix-in. So you say, okay, the first uh, attribute is the path to the PNG file. The second one is the path to the SVG file. And the third one is the ratio I want to start using the SVG instead of the PNG file. So you can say some path PNG, SVG, and then two for like standard version of this space. Um, then there's another thing. When you develop mobile first, you probably know that uh, you have problems with Internet Explorer lower than 9 because um, IE8 does not support any media queries. So all the code inside of the media at media is not visible to IE8. So usually you get the mobile view on your desktop IE8, which is not what you want. And so I, I wrote a little mix-in, which is used instead of at media, and it gets the size you want to uh, address. So I'm using minwidth, and then you just use it instead of the media, and you just have the content inside of it. And this is how it's used. So I have a style CSS file. I declare a variable, old EA, as false, as a default. And then I import the mix-in. So the, the first one would just be the mix-in. And then I use this add include, and here you can see a mix-in having some content. So instead of writing add media all min width equals whatever, 700 pixels, I use the mix-in. And then I have an old CSS, a CSS file, and I'm setting the variable to true and just importing the whole style CSS file. And so I will get two different files compiled. I will get a style CSS file with all the media queries, and I will get an old IE CSS file with all the code inside of the media query, query but without the media query wrapped around. So all the code that would be hidden from IE8 because it's inside of the media query will just be written directly into the file. And then including it into your HTML, you just use conditional comments. You say, okay, for IE8 and lower, use the old IE CSS files, and for the other browsers, use the one with the media queries. And then there's uh, something like alternative style sheets. Um, that's a, an old technique, not many users anymore, but um, once in a project we, we wanted to change the colors of the main navigation, and my designer was coming up with, I think, 20 different color combinations. <laughs> and I don't want it to produce every combination and make screenshots out of it and things like that. So I, I added some variables to my files, and I defined all the colors, like the top navigation background color, the top navigation color, the hoover color, and the sub-navigation background color, and things like that. And I um, added some, some values to it, and then I just imported the, um, the ZAS, uh, ZAS file, which has all the um, selectors and the nesting inside. So I just have to, have to uh, define different variables, with different values, and just import the top navigation. And then I had um, different versions compiled. And then you can use, there are some browser plugins for Firefox or 
Chrome, you can just select from a list which of the alternate style sheets included in the web page I want to use. So they can, they were able to browse all the size of our website and picking the different color combinations for the navigation without, yeah, I don't, so I don't have to create all the screenshots in advance, they just can browse the site with a different color scheme. Yeah, there are some uh, sources. Um, the, the first one is the official documentation for SAS. The second one is the official documentation of Compass or the extra mix-ins. And the last one is a compar uh, comparability overview um, with the libsas and the Ruby versions. So you can see, okay, which functionality is not available in libsas and even which functionality is only available in SAS 3.4 and newer. Like that. So there's even some differences in the Ruby versions. So that's uh, <clears throat> all the things I wanted to tell you. Do we have any questions? Do you, could you demand of a, uh, an agency to uh, no SAS or less or something like that when you order a project as a customer? I mean, to, to be future proof, if you say so? Or is it like a good thing to have but not needed to have? Every new project we start, we either use less or thus. Um, one thing is the variables which we use. The other thing is nesting. We don't use a lot of mix-ins in some projects. But uh, especially being able to split your CSS files into many partials and have the code separated is very handy. Especially when many developers working on the same project at the same time, when you have a huge thousand of line CSS file, there's a huge probability that they might produce some conflicts when you have partial <coughs> files and you just import them in one major file, then usually one developer implementing one feature is just working in one partial. So the probability of a conflict in Git is yeah, less lower. Yeah. But you ignore the <coughs> you ignore the compiler. <coughs> CSS, yeah. When committing? Um, in some project, uh, we commit it into Git because we deploy it directly from Git to the, to the server. So the other way would be you just commit the uh, CSS files and then compile it on the production server, which might work in some cases, but the problem is when you have an error in your ZAS file and the compiler will try to compile it, then you get a CSS files with a huge error message and no code inside, so that might not be ideal for some project. So it's it's usually a good idea to also commit the compiled CSS files, depending on your deploy strategy. So if he's a, a buyer yeah. and he's going to say, "Well, I'd like you to write this in SAS," uh, you should he should probably make them have a documentation on what what kind of uh, uh, plugins really they, yeah. they need to have with the when Yeah, they should document okay sets. which extensions do we use and especially which kind of compiler do we use because different compilers <coughs> compile different SAS code. There might be only some white spaces or some comments and things like that. But when you have it in Git and two developers using two different compilers then you have a lot of changes in every commit because it will recompile the whole file. So especially with colors, um, you can have hex colors with three or six digits if, in some cases. And some compilers, they always produce six digits hex code and some always three digits. And so you have always overriding of those uh, compiled variables, which is very nice. And the good thing with the SCSS syntax is when you start using SAS, you can just use ordinary CSS code. So you can just rename your CSS file into SCSS and just use the same file. Because the syntax is the same as CSS when you don't use any nesting of variables. So like the one project we were using, we were starting using SAS, it has something like 5,000 codes of CSS file, uh, CSS code. And the first step I, I was taking was I split the CSS file into partials, but in the first, uh, in the beginning, I only used 
standard CSS code. And then I, in the second step, I replace like the fixed color with a variable and replace it in all the other files. So you don't have to rewrite all your codes when you use the SCSS syntax. Just use your CSS codes, just rename the file, and then step by step you can say, okay, here I could do some nesting, here I can use a mix in for like border radius instead of the vendor prefixes, and here I can use a variable and things like that. How, how does it work with, um, I mean, you said you do both do uh, CSS and, uh, and less projects, yeah. but well, how, how, how do you, why? I mean, uh, <laughs> like, uh, I, um, then, you, then you would have diff, you would have multiple standards in the same company. Isn't that not that good? That's true, but um, um, like I, I started in, in the company in, in April and they were using less, but they really don't know very much about less. Okay. And the syntax is, is quite similar. So in, like in SCSS, you use a dollar sign for a variable. In less, you use an add. The nesting is the same. Mix-ins are named differently, but like the, the most features are very the same in, in less and less. So it's, it's pretty easy to, yeah, to learn thus when you know less. But when you have a huge project, and you want to convert like all your less files into thus, that might be a bigger issue because there are some differences, especially with mixing. So when you have a, a huge project in less, just keep it in less and for the new project use thus. Can you elaborate quickly on the differences between less and sas and, and sort of boot, I heard bootstrap is moving over to sas? Yes. So yeah, yeah like thing thing I I I was looking at Bootstrap and Foundation, and Foundation was using Zas, mm. and back then they only used the, like the JavaScript compiler for less, and that's why I don't use Bootstrap like four years ago. Yeah. But now they switched to Zas because Zas has way more features, okay. and also Zas has those extensions like Compass. Mm. Less is a very basic compiler. It it's like the the standard Zas functionalities, and even some of the features they they don't have. So Zas is. There are more features, there are more extensions, and I think it's the one to start with. So if you don't use any of those, I would recommend using SAS. Yeah. Okay, thank you.